Okay, so we've temporarily only come up with a way of imposing a series of a very special displacement pattern and writing out a bunch of free body diagrams, but how do we pull all these together associated with what really happens in the real system? And this is, we're going to do sort of two things here at once. One of them is to replace what these ends are with the internal axial forces with uh, what's going on inside and linking them to the actual displacement patterns, but we're also going to pull in then uh, a global picture about the, the way we might represent this mathematically, which is really the stiffness method in a nutshell. Right? So note here that in the special displacement pattern of 100, zero, zero, when we go look at then our force displacement relationship, which is the axial force equals the spring constant times the deformation of the member, so that's EA over L of the member times then the deformation of the member, well that's a 1 in this case, right? So we end up with that globally K11 is equal to EA over L, right? Now here, this one, this is Q2, it's the force at degree of freedom 2 caused by the unit displacement at 1, all others being 0, so that will be equal to a minus EA over L for that member 1. All right, so notice this little, it's not really sleight of hand, but it's saying, hey, in the special displacement pattern, then we can recognize that what we're really getting is the stiffness coefficient for a very specific uh, uh, set of displacements. And this last one, of course, K31 was equal to 0. When we go to the second one, then what we're given is that K at 1 caused by the unit displacement at 2, K12 is equal to minus N1 or minus EA over L, so minus K1, where K is by definition EA over L for that particular member. right? And then this one, which globally is K22, will be equal to K1 plus K2. Right? And then this last one is K32 is equal to this minus little K2. Now in our specific case, these two members were identical, both of length and E and A, so K1 equaled uh, K2, and that was 966.6 repeating kips per inch. And then this last one would be okay, K at 1, Displacement at 3 is equal to 0. K capital here, 2, 3, is equal to minus K2. And then this one is going to be that K3, 3 is equal to K2. Right now, in general, of course, these are not the actual displacements we have up in here. Here we have some general set, so if we take the unknown D1 times this unit pattern and then add to it D3 times, and again unknown, add that up there, and then D3 times this pattern, add it to it all, that superposition, we'll get back to what we wanted to begin with. Right? And so notice here that the total force at Q1 then is going to be the sum of all these factored pieces. So back over here, what we get is Q1 equals then K11 times the displacement that happens at D1 plus the force at 1 associated with the displacements that actually happen at 2 plus K1 at 1 times the displacements that are happening here. So what we really have done is just a superposition of this force plus that force plus that force to write that equation. Right? Do the same thing at Q2. Q K21 times D1 plus K22, notice the pattern, times D2 plus K23 times D3. Right? So the first one is at the degree of freedom we're at. And then the second one is then summing through the various combinations of all of them, some of which these might be zero.
So in the stiffness method, we are writing equilibrium equations where the unknowns are these displacements. Now in general, you'd say that you could write this as our nodal forces equal then our stiffness matrix times our displacement vector. In this case, that's 3 by 3 for the stiffness matrix, 3 by 1 for each of the uh, two vectors, the force vector and the um, displacement vector. Right Now, what this looks like in this very specific case is that we would have in the K11 location, we'd have EA over L for member 1. We had minus EA over L for member uh, 1 right there and a 0 in that location. Then we had minus EA over L here for member 1 and then in this location we had EA over L for member 1 plus EA over L for member 2 and then on the off term we had EA over L for member 2 the negative, we had a 0 here and then we finish it off like so. That was our stiffness matrix for our system. This is the total global system. right? And that, of course, gets a little tedious to write, so you'll see shorthand written like this, that this would be K1 minus K1 minus K1. This is the sum of K1 and K2, which, yes, numerically were the same. That's K1. There's a 0 there, a 0 there minus K1 and K2. Notice this pattern that it is symmetric in that we do start to see some off diagonal zero terms. The bigger our system is, the more of these uh, zero values that we'll see. And for our very specific case, what you would see then is numerically 966.6 repeating here, off diagonal term. Oops, there's not a, there's the decimal place and then we'll have zero there. Off diagonal will be that one. This will be two times 966.6 repeating. And then zero and right. And given our original system that we had here, if we really have zeros and zeros for D1 and D2, the free degree of freedom would in this case go all the way down to that right there. Right? So we'll, when we go to apply this in another um, scenario, we'll, we'll get into this sort of detail about how to manipulate it. But this would be the global stiffness matrix. And it would include the free and the restrained degrees of freedom. 